All right, good evening. Here we are live on KIONRightNow.com. This is our very first digital town hall meeting with Salinas Police Chief Kelly McMillan. Uh, thanks for coming in. We have about an hour here all the way through 7 p.m. this evening. So if you are watching us right now on the web, uh, tell your friends. It's very easy to go to the web, uh, click on in, and hey, send in your questions uh, to news tips at KIONRightNow.com or through our Facebook page, and one of our producers will then hand me your questions, and if I can, I'll ask them to, uh, to the police chief. Uh, so what are your emotions? You ready for this? I'm ready. This is exciting stuff. Okay, so this past week we had Operation Snake Eyes in Salinas. 47 arrests, most of them in Salinas. So this first question coming from Raquel Martinez uh, through email today saying, any more operations like Snake Eyes in the future? Well, we hope so. One of, the, one of the things that people need to know about Snake Eyes is that's not an operation that we can do just at the Salinas Police Department, just because of the scale of it. Collaboration. We don't, have enough, we don't have enough people to do an operation of that size. And so that was really um, driven by a lot of our law enforcement partners. It was um, uh, the Sheriff's Department had a huge hand in it. In fact, they originated the case um, because it was mostly Salinas crooks involved. You know, we had a big role, but then, of course, we had to bring in um, a, lo a lot of federal agencies, um, a lot of state agencies, and there was months and months of work, literally hundreds of officers taking part and thousands of hours into that case. So because they're so big and so complex, we can't do them as often as we'd like to, but we're certainly planning on doing them at every opportunity. And for the media, all the information comes out, you know, that day, and it often comes from the neighbors. They say, hey, what's happening on my street? I see police, and they're doing these investigations, and that's how we find out, and then the information comes flooding in. You guys hold the press conferences. Um, how do things go with the collaboration? How is that working since you've taken over as police chief uh, with state, federal agencies, doing it more on the same level as before at the department? Oh, no, I think it's getting stronger every day, and, and it was it, uh, really started by... Uh, Mayor Donahue and um, Chief Featheroff before I took office. Uh, they built the Law Enforcement Operations Center up, got the partners in there, <clears throat> pardon me, established really strong relationships, particularly with the federal government, but um, certainly with the state as well, CHP specifically, and the Bureau of Narcotics Enforcement. And um, so having these, all these federal and state agents in town uh, in a strong presence for the first time they were able to see what the activity level was in Salinas and Monterey County, and so it made sense for them to stay here, and we provided the space for them to stay in, so that's how they ended up um, being such a strong, ongoing presence in, in Salinas and Monterey County, and that's why you see the level of, of state and federal activity alongside the local law enforcement. Sure, so is there a pro and con to sort of being on the map uh, with that sort of stuff? Well, You're on the map almost for the wrong reason, but yet we're getting the help. That's the thing. It, uh, obviously, if I had if I had my druthers, I'd rather have no crime problem, no reason for the FBI or ATF or the DEA to be in Salinas. Uh, that's not our reality. We're working hard to change that. But as long as we do have these issues, we absolutely will take all the help we can get. All right. Uh, one more question here from Raquel Martinez. She sent in a few. Uh, she wants to know why do you believe that Salinas residents are sometimes hesitant hesitant at times to contact police? doing anything to reverse that? Yeah, I know you tell people, say, hey, we need your help, we need those witnesses, and we don't always get it. Uh, why are people afraid? Well, I'll, 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 give you, I'll, I'll give you a direct example of why people are afraid. Um, years ago, when I was a, an investigations commander, we were out investigating a shooting between some gang members, resulted in a homicide. And so we were doing a door-to-door, -door, and I knocked on a gentleman's door, told him what had gone on, and asked him if he had any information. He said, yeah, I know who did it told me, I know who shot that guy. Right. And then looked me in the eye and said, but I'm not gonna tell you because that guy lives in this neighborhood and I have to live in this neighborhood and he'll come after me. So there's a great deal of fear. Now, the important thing to remember is, in reality, when people do come forward as witnesses, it's incredibly rare that there's any kind of threats or retaliation, but people have the sense that that might happen and that really does hold them back. Uh, so that's a big part of it, is just fear of retaliation and fear of communicating with the police because they think that might put them in, in harm's way. And then the other part of it too is a great deal of our population, frankly, doesn't really trust and want to communicate with the police because they think we may come after them, we may you know, talk about, for instance, immigration status is always a big fear. And, and for the record, we do not ever ask that question, that it's not important to us. Um, but because there's a lot of misunderstanding around how, how we'll handle their information, we believe that that 
really does complicate matters in terms of communication sometimes. We recently did a, a story um, on Central Coast News about remaining anonymous, if that truly is anonymous. I know it is with the tip lines, right? It is with the tip lines. In fact, our tip line is set up in such a way that when you call that the we tip number, um, that you, you, you give your information to a real person, but your number actually cannot be traced. So even if, even if we were subpoenaed to provide information from WeTip, it, it physically cannot be accessed. We actually cannot get that information. Okay, here's another uh, question coming in. This one uh, via Facebook, I believe. Uh, Joaquin Martinez, Joaquin, if you're watching. Uh, Chief, your official position on officers, and he put in bold letters constantly using their cell phones while on patrol. And let me tell you, Joaquin, you're not the only one. We do get this question from time to time, whether it be uh, police officers in any jurisdiction, uh, CHP, what have you. Uh, but we've had this question before. So for the record, officers using their phones, using their computers there in the car, what's the protocol? That's, it's, it's an interesting question. And this isn't the first time I've heard it. Obviously, I get it all I the time. I think we have well. a few of them. So it's a pretty they're, common. They're, we got about three or four of them. Yeah. Same question. Though. It's a pretty common question. I think it's a reasonable one. And and I have told my officers specifically, it's disingenuous to be driving down the road, talking on your cell phone, and then pull somebody over, right, and write them a ticket for the same thing. And what people need to understand is, if you look inside a police car, it's just filled with technology. There are computers in there. You've got a radio talking to you. And the, the phone is a tool that, that we expect our officers to use. Now, people may not get that there's a law enforcement exception for talking on the cell phone. It's actually legal for a police officer to do it. We don't encourage it. It's only for official business when they're on their phone. But many times when, you, crime scene or when you see an officer driving down the road, they could be talking to a witness. They could be taking a report over the phone. Coming back to your earlier question about people not wanting to talk, provide information to police officers, a lot of times they just don't want a police officer at their front door. So the officers will use their phone to contact witnesses, um, run questions by their supervisors. It's the, 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 the calls that you see are largely being used for business purposes. Now, what about training with that said? Do officers go through special training as far as driving behind the wheel with those distractions? Well, yeah, that's one of the, th one of the, one of the problems that we face is, you know, distracted driving is a huge issue. It's no different for police officers. Now, we are cognizant of, of how we do that and just the, the amount of time we spend looking at, you know, computer screens, listening to the radio, um, dealing with telephone calls, having people talking to you from, from outside. Um, does improve those skills, but as a rule, we want our officers, if they're going to be on the computer talking on the phone, to pull over and do it as safely as they can. Here's a question, another one coming in via Facebook. This one from Satrina Villasenor, uh, Police Chief Kelly McMillan. She wants to know, we know that you are understaffed and asking is a long shot, but she would love to see more patrol units on Salina streets in general, but specifically the north side According to Satrina, she feels that it's a neighborhood that's been lost in the shadow of East Salinas. Uh, and I think if you went to people in East Salinas, they'd say they'd like to see more police officers because they're on the south side, and the south side would say the same thing about the north side. Here's the reality. Uh, we deploy our police officers in a pretty even distribution across the city. There are a, 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 um, somewhat fewer in South Salinas where the crime is less. There's some are more in East and North Salinas where the crime tends to be a little bit higher. But the reality is once a patrol shift gets going, those officers are on calls and they're going to wherever the calls are. So the fact that we deploy them evenly across the city doesn't mean they stay evenly across the city. So for instance, it's very common to have a couple or three major events going on in the city, a, a, a shooting over here, a domestic disturbance going over here, and a, a fight over here. Well, that's where all your police officers are. They're no longer patrolling a specific neighborhood. They get they get sent to where the action is, where the call is at the moment. So a North Salinas officer could be sent to the east side. East Salinas officers could be going to the south side. They're shooting all over town, depending on what the activity level is. Our ability to actually go out and patrol, proactively look for things, right? And this is the quality of life, things like speeders and, uh, you know, abandoned cars, the things that make, make our lives just kind of aggravating on a day-to-day -day basis. Community involvement, too. We don't, the, yeah. the community involvement piece. We don't have a lot of free time for that. And the solution, you've talked about it, it's simply more officers, more money. You know, and, the, and, and, the, and, and I think that's another one of the questions. What are the chances of getting more officers? Uh, right now we're going backwards. We're losing officers. Every time someone retires or quits or takes a job at another police department, 
Uh, that, that position today is being frozen. I can't, I can't hire behind it because we have this big deficit in the city. So the only other option is to look for an outside revenue stream. Uh, Joaquin Martinez, and we'll get to that. Joaquin Martinez sending in one more question. He wants to know, what is the Salinas Police Department doing to change, he says, the negative image and relationship that SPD has with the public, specifically the youth who are not criminals? What do you say to that? Yeah, and, and that's another one. I think that's, that's a perception issue that sometimes doesn't really match up with reality. Some kids do have a negative perception of law enforcement. I get that. A lot of kids don't. And I would point to the thousands of kids that come through our Police Activities League programs every year, have a pretty positive relationship with law enforcement. Yeah, and that's PAL. So what does PAL do? So PAL is, is a law enforcement sponsored activities league where we, um, we provide athletic opportunities. Junior Giants is a great example. Uh, the Salinas Police Activities League is one of three pals left in the state that are charter members of the Junior Giants organization. We're in their Hall of Fame. Um, Giants organization contributes a lot to the Salinas Police Activities League. So things like baseball, soccer, ballet, karate, um, social activities, leadership camps for kids, um, snow trips, uh, trips to the beach. So while I understand that some kids may have this negative perception, there are thousands and thousands out there that have a very positive perception. Okay, here's a question uh, via Facebook from Jennifer Wigon saying, why if there is a shortage of police officers, why do they double up in a patrol car? She said that she would think more cops would be out patrolling and if they need the help of a fellow officer, they could simply call for backup, right? So sometimes we see partners out on the streets, why not put them in their own cars? That's an interesting question. As a rule, a patrol officer works alone in their car. They, we, we use what we call solo beat cars. So when there, are, when there are two officers in a car, you're seeing one of a few situations. It's a new cop and a training officer. So, so if, if Mark quits being a news anchor and decides to be a police officer, the first four or five months of your career are gonna be spent alongside a field training officer. So you'll be working in a car with an experienced officer. So that's one scenario. Um, our gang units always work two officer cars because the, the nature of their, their activity is to go out and find gang members and deal with them. So it's easier just to take your backup with you. Uh, so those are, those are the classic examples where you have two officers in a car, but most of the time our beat cars are one officer. All right, again, we are just getting rolling here on KIONRightNow.com. We thank all of you for logging on and spread the word. Uh, we're here through 7 p.m. You send in your questions. We have many of them uh, to go through this evening, all of them for Salinas Police Chief Kelly McMillan. Uh, if you send them in, our producer is bringing them in. I could then ask them and get the questions for you this evening uh, and spread the word. Tell your neighbors, pick up the phone, say, hey, go to KIONRightNow.com and we'll get as many questions answered as we can. Here's one from Erica Tarango. She says, this might sound extreme, but has the Salinas Police Department ever thought of asking military force to patrol the streets of Salinas? Um, so at one point in time, because the public was asking the question, we did look into having the National Guard come into Salinas. And I mean, I've heard this question for probably the last six it's years. A, it's a very common one. Uh, there, there are a lot of really common questions out there about how we can solve the problem in Salinas. And this military issue is one of them. So it turns out that, that unless you're declaring a state of emergency, you don't get the National Guard. They won't come and police your city. And Erica, she says in her question, as the second part, it said, if this town has become into a war zone, use war zone protection. So those are her words. Yeah. And, and, I, and I would question the idea that we're in a war zone. Do we have a violence problem? Absolutely. Do we want to declare martial law, suspend the Constitution, set up checkpoints? I don't think any of us want to live in that world. And so the reality is the military option is not an option for us here in Salinas. Um, more quality policing is the way to go. Okay, here's a question from Efren Venegas saying, in his opinion, a lot of this opinion, uh, public perception coming in, uh, why do five patrol units have to respond to a simple traffic stop? Uh, why do the units have to be at La Plaza Bakery and Starbucks at the same time? So, so let's, take the, let's take the Starbucks La Plaza Bakery question first. Officers get their breaks, right? I, just like in any job, officers get their breaks. And it's, it's common to see officers at, you know, Starbucks is the common one, but in any number of places where a police officer is comfortable, getting out of their car and relaxing for a few minutes. We're required to give them breaks and lunches. By law, they have to eat. They have to be able to use the restroom just like everybody else, right? So 
Um, I think when, when you see officers gathering together, I know sometimes you'll see multiple jurisdictions in the same shop. We have a policy, you shouldn't see more than three uniformed police officers in a coffee shop at any one time, but sometimes there'll be a couple of highway patrolmen, maybe some sheriff's deputies, because we like to go where nice people are, and those are coffee shops and bakeries so we can get out and, and, and relax. So, so that's one. Now, the, the other question was on the traffic stop. Why do you see five officers on a traffic stop? And most of the time, you don't. You see one. Maybe there's something more than just the traffic and stop. And that's exactly what the answer is, Mark. If, if when you drive by a traffic stop and you see three, four, five police officers lined up there, what you don't know is, is that a wanted felon? Is there a gun in that car? Is that guy dangerous? Are there drugs in the car? Are they preparing to go do something else? There, there are so many questions um, raised by why are those five cops there? You can't really answer it, but it's not because they're there to visit their friend. Sure. They're there for police business. I think it was maybe about a month ago now, we had a uh, SUV that was pulled over in front of Alsa High School and uh, you had the five or six units behind it. We started getting the emails and the phone calls. Why is this happening? Turns out I think it was a stolen vehicle mm -hmm. and you got the witness, uh, uh, the description from witnesses of the suspect vehicle and where they went direction and you guys were right on it so this is a perfect example right and and, the, and so why does it take that many car that that many police officers to pull over a stolen vehicle car well the and the answer is because typically that car will run or people will flee from it or they're you know obviously they, know they're in, or they could be armed so that's why you see that kind of response okay here's a question coming in through facebook from jose castillo did spd hire more traffic units we know the answer to that would be no uh, but jose says there seems to be a lot of traffic Traffic enforcement happening around Salinas. One most recent example last week in front of Salinas High School, they had three motorcycle cops uh, giving out traffic citations. Uh, so the focus on doing operations like that. So what what Jose saw there was um, officers working off of a grant, a distracted driving grant or the click it or ticket grant that we have. And so they're going specifically after distracted drivers. That's the cell phone users or um, drivers that are not wearing seatbelts. And so they're being paid for with grant funds to, you know, because, because those are two of the big injury causers that we have. Distracted driving turns out to be um, probably more dangerous than a slightly intoxicated driver in terms of the level of unawareness of their surroundings. And of course, un uh, drivers that aren't belted into their car are likely to get injured in an accident. So that's the awareness thing. And those grants take place in different places and different times throughout the city. So that's what he was looking at. All right, again, we have so many questions. This may hop around just a bit, but I want to get to this one. I believe this one is through Twitter, coming from G. Delgadio II. He wants to know from Salinas Police Chief Kelly McMillan, how can I get into the police academy as a recruit? Well, unfortunately, right now in Salinas, that's a real challenge because, as we mentioned, our budget's going the wrong way. We are not able to hire because we don't have the money to hire. Uh, in fact, we're, we're, we're losing police officer positions. But, the, it, but generally speaking, anyone seeking a career in law enforcement should first of all do their research on where they want to work because being a police officer in Salinas is much different than being a police officer in Monterey and it's much different than being a sheriff's deputy in Monterey County. Those are all different environments to work in the same profession. So they need to do that kind of homework and then it's a matter of reaching out to that agency or that jurisdiction, finding out what their application process is uh, and then they're typically uh, invited to submit an application, go through an oral board, go through a background investigation, which includes a polygraph examination, a health examination, a physical test, jumping over walls, things like that. If you pass all that and you're hired, sent to the police academy, that's now, I think, six months long. Graduate from the police academy, then you're out into the field training program we just talked about, and you're off and running as a police officer. Now, with that said, speaking of your experience, I mean, you spent most of your career in Salinas, right? I have. And so how's that process gone, staying with one city, not hopping around to other jurisdictions? Well, so I started as a young police officer in my hometown. I grew up in Hollister. I was a deputy sheriff there for a couple of years. I was also a deputy in San Diego County for a couple of years before I came to Salinas in 1988. Uh, and it just turns out that Salinas, uh, Salinas suited me. It was, it was the kind of work I like to do. The men and women of the Salinas Police Department are, are, are an incredibly close-knit family uh, and, and consummate professionals. Uh, and the police work is always interesting. The community is a great place to be. So that's why it's worked for me. Here's a comment, a question that just came in, just got handed this paper to me from one of our producers. Uh, this from Nick Anda via Facebook. So Nick, we hope you're watching right now online. Um, how does he expect people to rely, let alone trust police, when he says response times are now measured in hours? Well, 
I, I would hope that Nick and other people understand that response times vary depending on the nature of the call. So we do get quickly to those things that are threats to life and property, and, and those unfortunately are the violent felonies, shootings, stabbings, things like that. That's where our officers are responding to. Now, if Nick has called the police because someone broke into his car and stole a stereo, he's competing with people who have been shot for a police officer's time. And so, because we have to prioritize calls based on threat, risk, and severity, the lower priority calls, even though it's the highest priority in that person's life at the time, that falls in line. People are often surprised to hear that on day shift patrol, we put 11 police officers out to police an active city of 153,000. There are 11 patrol officers. So they get used up pretty quickly. Really quickly. Uh, you know, just to give the shout out to Dilcia Ramirez, she really had basically the same question. She was wondering uh, why it took them, Salinas Police, six hours, she says, to respond to a 911 uh, home robbery call uh, back last month. And after providing leads to where the stolen items might be, Dilcia says that she hasn't heard back, uh, but it all goes along the same line, right? It's just manpower. Well, it's manpower and, and uh, not knowing her specific case, I couldn't answer why she hasn't heard back. Maybe she has since she asked the question, um, but I would say if anybody has a question at the police department is not getting an answer, then they need to reach out to the watch commander or leave a message or send an email to me at the police department and we'll look into the, we always look into these questions. Here's a question uh, just coming in as well that was handed to me about five minutes ago from Cesar Rosales. So Cesar, we hope you're watching right now online. Uh, Cesar wants to know if we stop using our police to ticket citizens, maybe we could save those resources to help our citizens instead of trying to hurt them financially. Well, we got a lot of opinions here, right? Well, yeah, I, I, I get the sentiment, but, but, but we don't, so people need to understand we don't make money off of citations. It's, it's not a revenue stream for us. Now, I've get, heard that before from other jurisdictions. Yeah, we have very little of, most of that money goes to the state. The reason that we do traffic enforcement is to keep people safe. If we have a problem with, uh, here's a great example. Right now we're having a problem with fixie bicycles. And for viewers that may not know what a fixie bicycle is, it's a fixed gear bicycle, which means if the back wheel is going, the pedals are going. You can't coast on this bike, and many kids will not put brakes on the bikes. And so we're seeing an inordinate amount of these bicycles crashing into cars because they can't stop the bikes. And so um, our traffic officers specifically are, are out looking for, now it looks like you're harassing a kid on a bike to the casual observer, but because we have this increase in pretty severe injuries, to kids who are riding bikes that are illegal to operate because they don't have brakes without helmets and they're getting themselves hurt, I think there's a compelling public interest to go out and issue citations so that we can start correcting that problem. I don't know if it's simply that we just hear about it more in Salinas, it's the biggest city on the Central Coast, but it seems that we hear about these pedestrian versus vehicles much more often and oftentimes, I mean, it, it involves kids. Uh, is it a bigger problem in this city? Um, I, I can't say that it's a bigger problem in the city because I've never asked that question. It's a tragic problem in this city. Uh, and it seems like, I think you're right, Mark, that recently we've had this, this increase of young kids and, and very typically it happens close to their home where a, a young child will run out into the driveway as somebody is coming home or leaving and that child's been run over. Tragically, it often happens at the hands of a family member. Um, it's devastating to everyone, um, obviously the family, but to the officers that respond and we spend a great deal of time dealing with the, the trauma to the officers that come out of those cases. Um, but that, but that, there's been an unusual increase in, in those kind of driveway cases and young children being, being run over. But we do live in a densely populated town uh, with a lot of traffic and, and again, back to this original question of why we issue citations, they're to correct people's behavior to reduce injuries. That's ultimately the theory. Yeah, people uh, always expect that there's a uh, ticket quota that officers need to reach. Any uh, truth behind that? None, none whatsoever. We can write as many as we like. And we say that jokingly, but uh, um, our officers often complain that they'll be driving to a call and see a, see a pretty substantial traffic violation right in front of them, but they can't address it because they have to get to whatever that domestic violence call. And that's another complaint we get. I was there, somebody ran a red light right in front of a police officer and he ignored that violation. He's on his way to another well, call. he's probably on his way to another call. Here's a question. This one via Twitter from Taylor Moria wanting to know about Chinatown. Uh, the source uh, for drugs in the Salinas area is Chinatown. There needs to be more of a presence there. Why don't they uh, have more presence there in that area of town? I'd sure like to. 
I would like to have a greater presence in a variety of neighborhoods. Chinatown, Old Town, Salinas Unified Business Association, there are areas in North Salinas I'd like to have place-based police officers that are assigned to that community. Chinatown specifically, uh, you know, we, we do work down there quite a bit. Um, in fact, Snake Eyes, we were just talking about that big gang case that we just wrapped up a couple of weeks arrests. ago. 47 arrests, major gang leadership disruption, um, some you know pretty substantial seizures out of that, $69,000 in cash, some firearms, some drugs. Uh, that case originated because of hard work in Chinatown. That's where it started. You know, so we're down there. You know, what is the daily scene down there? If, if you patrol down there, what are you gonna see? Well, what you're gonna see in Chinatown is a lot of homeless people and they're there because there are services for the homeless down there. Um, and, and it is an area of town that will accommodate them. So if a homeless person needs to stay somewhere and they camp out on you know, the doorsteps of someone's house in North Salinas, somebody's gonna call them, we're gonna go, we're gonna move them along. Well, if they do that in Chinatown because that's kind of, it's, it's an area that, that the community has kind of come to accept as a homeless gathering spot, then they're less likely to be harassed. The unfortunate part of that is because, as the caller pointed out, that's also the you know, ground zero for the drug trade. The drug trade brings violence. People who are homeless, um, you know, just because they're out of work and, and they're down on their luck, and that's where they end up, they end up becoming victims. Uh, to the to the drug dealers and 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 the, and the criminals that are in Chinatown. All right, we got another drug question. This one coming in uh, via Twitter from Shelley 007. Are there any investigations going on about cartels in the Monterey County area, and how much do they influence gang activity? The cartel question is a big one, uh, and that's one that we're keeping an eye on. We know that that there are local connections to cartels, um, particularly with our street gangs that are um, brokering some of their drugs, doing some of the transports. We found this out in some of these major operations like Snake Eyes, not that one specifically, um, but like Knockout, if you recall that operation, and some of the other ones that rolled out from that that occurred in the San Joaquin Valley. We know there are, there are cartel connections. Um, so, so it's something we do keep an eye on. We know that the Panga boats are landing here in Monterey County offloading drugs. That's an occurrence. That's, that's been a big right issue here. across the Central Coast. So these uh, Panga boats, Ponga boats, whatever you want to call them, essentially, I mean, these are small fishing boats loaded with often drugs, marijuana. They're coming from south of the border, landing here on our shores to bring the drugs in. Uh, so we're seeing it now here in Monterey County, Santa Cruz County? Yes, we are. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Happens from the Big Sur Coast all the way up to Moss Landing. Question here uh, via Twitter coming in from Sodman uh, at Twitter uh, saying, I always hear people say, P uh, police pulled me over for no reason. What can you say to those claims? I, well, I say that they're wrong. We, we don't pull people over for no good reason. Sometimes people don't, don't agree with the reason that we've pulled them over. Um, but, but we are a society of laws and I'm very proud of the fact that the Salinas Police Department specifically uh, adheres very closely to those laws. So if we pull people over, it's because there's a legitimate law enforcement interest, probable cause or criminal violation to be pulled over. We talked earlier about the cell phone laws and how if needed, uh, police officers are exempt, allowed to use cell phones, computer, whatever they need to do to communicate in an emergency. Uh, this question coming in via email from Jess L. Uh, wanting to know Salinas Police Chief Kelly McMillan, why do some police officers continue to drive over the speed limit if it seems that they're not going anywhere for an emergency. So claims here that officers are seen speeding on the road. And that does happen. And a lot of times what you'll see is an officer who's trying to get to a call. And, and so I think it's important to distinguish between driving faster than the flow of traffic versus, you know, kind of the reckless speeding where they should have their lights and sirens on. When, when we need to get somewhere that quickly, then it's lights and sirens time. And that's, you know, obviously you'll see a cop speeding in that scenario. But sometimes you do see an officer driving faster than the flow of traffic. And a lot of times they're just moving towards a potential situation that's, that's um, uh, unfolding. So typically a scenario where a police officer in an adjacent beat has made a traffic stop and there's something about what the other officer is hearing on the radio or that other officer is called for for some more backup, but it's not an emergency backup, that officer's not gonna waste time in getting there. And they're not gonna turn their lights on per se. Not necessarily. Now, now the reality is if they're going to be um, driving in a manner that would present a public hazard, then they need to have those lights on. If they're gonna be you know, rolling through red lights, rolling through stop signs, that light, the lights and siren need to be on. Um, but sometimes you do see 
you do see officers traveling faster than the speed limit. Now I would add, if an officer is driving recklessly without lights and sirens on, we would invite that that witness to call us and we'll investigate that complaint. See where it goes. Uh, so again, that one was from uh, Jess L. So thanks for sending it in via email. Uh, here's a question from Jose Bautista uh, via email, wanting to know from the Salinas Police Chief, do you agree with what's happening in Colorado about marijuana being legalized? And do you think that the same should happen here in California? Obviously, a couple years ago, failed ballot measure, um, but saying, you know, to pass the marijuana law to keep nonviolent offenders and small marijuana offenders out of jail, out of prison. So what's your whole thought legalizing marijuana? So, so there, there are kind of two, two shades to that question. Should it be legalized? I don't believe so. I think that's absurd. And and fundamentally without getting, because this is a, an hour program in itself, sure. right? Um, I, don't think, I don't think America handles its intoxicants well as it is. And I'll point to alcohol as a case in point, that individuals may be responsible drinkers, but as a society, we lose a lot of lives to alcohol abuse. So why would we want to introduce yet another legal intoxicant when we can't handle the ones that we've got? Um, so, so that's on the legalization question. Now the question of criminalizing it, meaning should you go to jail or should you be treated for using marijuana? I don't think throwing people that use marijuana in jail um, serves any significant purpose. I think there, that, that that's appropriate for treatment and for counseling in order to get over whatever issue is, is um, causing that person to use, assuming it's a, it's a a chronic problem. Now, with that said, I mean, uh, you talk about staffing problems and when the ballot measure for legalizing marijuana in California was brought up a couple of years back, uh, one of the concerns from law enforcement was the fact of enforcing it. How are you going to really enforce this as far as how much people have, where they're smoking it? Uh, that would be a concern, yeah? Well, there's that. And then there's also the conflict with federal law. It's still a federal crime. Uh, and, and, and while we don't directly enforce federal, federal laws, um, we do have an obligation to observe the law generally. So uh, the whole question of, of enforcement or lack thereof, um, you know, compliance, we see a lot of violations of, of the medical marijuana laws where, where people are, are getting, um, you know, pretty suspicious medical marijuana cards for, for some questionable med uh, mer uh, medical reasons. Uh, so there, there are a lot of problems with with this idea of, of medical marijuana and, uh, and, and legalization. I just don't think it's a good idea, nor do most of my colleagues. All right, again, you're watching us uh, live here on the web, KIONRightNow.com. If you want to get a drink of water, you may. Um, keep those questions coming. Periodically, I'm getting more uh, pieces of paper uh, handed to me with uh, your questions, and we're doing our best to ask all of them. I'm thinking, though, we're not going to have time because there are so many. Again, this is the first digital town hall that we've done. Salinas Police Chief Kelly McMillan with us. Here's another question from Raquel Martinez, uh, wondering, what is your opinion of the whole process after you arrest someone? This involves the media, for example, things such as the courts, judges, media, and so on, how, how that whole process works. I'm kind of interested about your thoughts about the media aspect. Well, I, uh, I think in, in our society, which is an open society, um, our courts are open, you have the ability to be confronted by the witnesses. I think the media plays a vital role. And so I think up to the point that it becomes harmful to an investigation, that you and the public at large should have access to as much information as we can provide. I think the public should know what's going on in their courtrooms and should understand what happens when someone is incarcerated or sent into a diversion program or a counseling program. Um, so I absolutely invite media scrutiny. But I will draw the line and have drawn the line at safety issues and at compromising criminal cases because I think first and foremost, our obligation is to seek justice for victims. That's who we represent. You know, talking about the court system or when it gets to, uh, you know, going to jail, recidivism, people being released and reoffending. Um, any way to, to address that to reduce the recidivism rate? Well, I think, and, and this gets at the, the whole issue of realignment, AB 109, where Governor, uh, Governor Brown decided that a certain class of, of prisoner no longer belongs in state prison, and that's because the state prison system was unable to provide adequate health care. That's what drove the whole realignment issue. And so what you're seeing is a lot of people who were in state custody, and California incarcerates a lot of people every year, something like 100,000 people, 103,000 I think was the last number I heard. That's a lot of people to have locked up. 
So the idea that, that, that decarceration should occur and people should be you know, let out of prison who are not serious, nonviolent, non-sexual offenders and treated, I think is a good idea. Now the reality is there's a lot of people that need a lot of treatment and that's not being funded. So what you have are people who have pretty substantial underlying issues that's causing criminal behavior being turned loose back on our streets and they're not getting the services that they need. They're getting some, but not enough. Yeah, supporters of Governor Jerry Brown's AB 109, that was the prison realignment plan. Um, they would say that over the past two years, there are less inmates uh, in state prison. It has been reduced. I mean, in your eyes, well, there, is there are, it a success? There's no question there are fewer inmates in state prison. That's because they're either stuffed in the Monterey County Jail, which is bursting at the seams, or they're walking our streets. There's no question they're out of And then busting at the seams, and that's where the perception comes of inmates being released early. I mean, AB 109 doesn't say, we're going to release inmates early, but it's a cause and effect of, well, now the county jails are overloaded, so you, you do see some inmates being released. Well, there is a downstream effect when, when prisoners are taken out of street prison and incarcerated in the county jail, that pushes out offenders at the other end that are trying to get into county jail. So, so people that my officers would have normally locked up are getting released from jail much sooner or being cited out. And, and one of the things that we're seeing and we're waiting to see if there's a clear connection with realignment is something like a 30% increase in property crime just in the city of Salinas since realignment because there's so many more offenders on the street. All right, so we talked earlier from another viewer uh, asking the question about police responding to a traffic stop and seeing maybe five patrol cars. Uh, let's talk about a crime scene. This question coming in from Richard Nelson. So, Richard, I hope you're watching. He wants to know, do we really need to respond with 10 to 12 cop cars uh, when someone's shot on the streets of Salinas? Uh, the rest of the town at that point has no one left to respond to other calls. Uh, according to Richard, he sees, seems to see a lot of police officers standing around at a crime scene. That's right, and sometimes you do have officers standing around at a crime scene because a crime scene has to be protected for the integrity of evidence. And if, if you've ever unfortunately been to a crime scene, they attract dozens up to hundreds of spectators. And the only thing standing between those spectators and that crime scene that needs to be processed, measured, photographed, bag tagged, collected, and booked into evidence, a process that takes hours, are thin strips of yellow tape and a police officer standing on the other side. And then there are the detectives who have to do the interviews. There are the crime scene investigators who have to process the crime scene. Uh, th th there's a whole lot going on in those major crimes. So he's exactly right. Those major crime scenes deplete resources from everybody else. That get back, gets back to the earlier question about why did it take six hours for the officers to respond to my residential burglary? Full circle. Because they were all at that crime scene. Yeah. Okay, here's a, another question from Raquel Martinez. She sent in several. Uh, one of her questions here. Uh, found it rather interesting. Uh, does training stop once they are hired or is there a periodic training throughout the year um, with Salinas police officers? There's ongoing training at every level in the police department. Um, po police work is a very specialized field now. There are very few generalist police officers. And we just talked about um, a couple. So we'll talk about crime scene investigators and detectives. Everyone at the Salinas Police Officers, uh, at the Salinas Police Department starts off as a police officer, a patrol officer, and that's the training that they received in the academy and the field training program. Now, when they are selected for a special assignment, crime scene investigator, for instance, they're sent off to a two-week crime scene class. They come back, they train with our investigators uh, to learn how to use our equipment, and then ongoing specialized training, crime scene photography, uh, DNA collection and analysis. Same thing with detectives. Uh, detectives go through a, what we call a, a detective core course, learning the basics of writing search warrants and things like that. And then they go on to specialize in homicide investigation, robbery, sex crimes, and so on. So that process all the way up through, including me, uh, go through annual training to keep skills up and stay current on law, new cases, things like that. All right, we have about 20 minutes left here on KIONRightNow.com. We are streaming live through 7 this evening with uh, Salinas Police Chief Kelly McMillan. Thanks again. Uh, we're having a good time here getting yeah, through all these great. questions. Um, another one just coming in here, this one from Jose Coronel via Facebook. Jose, thanks for writing in. He wants to know anything being done about the prostitution problem in Salinas. The I know we've done stories on this. We have, and the prostitution problem is one of those, uh, unfortunately, you know, nuisance crimes that we have often does lead to bigger crimes, but generally is a nuisance crime 
uh, along with um, some of the parking issues that we face, uh, the traffic issues that we face, and this is a question of priorities and resources. We used to have a vice unit that did um, a, a prostitution enforcement, gambling enforcement, alcohol enforcement. Vice unit has been gone for a few years. That was one of the first things that we cut because it doesn't, it doesn't investigate the bigger, more serious crimes. Now, if we had more police officers, we would bring back vice and be able to address this prostitution problem. All right, a question here about uh, the station, the police department. Um, crumbling walls, not enough infrastructure to house all, you know, the department where it stands right now in 2013. Um, tell us about it. Well, the facility we're in now, the main police department, was uh, built in the 1950s and originally designed to house something like 65 employees. Uh, the Salinas Police Department now is about 200 employees. At one point, and you in don't time, even have enough. And at one point in time, we were about 260 employees. So our reality is the police department is jam-packed. It doesn't serve anybody's needs. Um, Use that phrase, busting at the seams. Busting at the seams. But, and it's not just, you know, I don't want people to think it's because we want just a nicer building. That would be nice, one that doesn't smell like sewage, that happens in one part of our detective bureau True story. constantly. True story. But the reality is we don't have the interview rooms that we need that if you came in as the victim of a crime, you would be walking down the hall passing suspects in crimes because we can't segregate those populations right now in the facilities. We don't have adequate juvenile holding facilities. We don't have good places to interview youth because there are rooms that should be set up specifically for them. The workspace for the police officers is atrocious and that affects productivity. So there are a variety of real functional law enforcement needs. Our crime lab is jam packed. We can't do good DNA analysis. Our evidence is spread out in a number of facilities across the city. That creates efficiency problems. I could go on for another hour just on the needs of the police department, but this community is not being served by the building we're in now. So how do we solve that? Is it a tax? Do we get grants from the state or the federal government? Uh, what's next? What's the reality? The question about grants is an important one because that's, that's another one. Why don't you write a grant for that? Well, if we could, we would have. Um, the, the federal government doesn't fund buildings, it doesn't fund police cars, it doesn't fund guns, bullets, uniforms, the things that are the rightful purview of the general fund. That's Salinas' responsibility. And the federal government, the state government would say, if Salinas wants a new police department, Salinas has to pay for a new police department. And so again, coming back to why don't we have more police officers, this is a question for your viewers. Do you want to invest in safety in Salinas? And, and, and that means fundraising, that means a tax measure. Would, it, would this tax measure that we keep talking about, would that go on the upcoming November ballot or where would that be placed, do that, we know? That's still a question. I think the, the sense that I'm getting that if a tax measure, and, and there is no tax measure yet, that's a conversation that's happening between the city council and our community right now. Um, and there are lots of questions. Should it be a general tax? Should it be a specific tax? A sales tax, if so, how much? A half cent, three quarters, a full cent? A lot of questions about that. Um, Even if you got the green light right now to build a new station, I mean, it takes time still to get the plans and build it. I mean, so realistically, if you were a betting man, you know, where do we stand with making it happen? If somebody dropped the millions of dollars that we'd need for a new police department in our lap right now, I would guess that we're five years away from opening the doors of a police department. It takes time. Well, it's a, it, and it's a different kind of building. It's not, you don't just go and find the guy that built a nice house and ask them to put up a police department. It has lab facilities, it has to be what they call a type one building so it can withstand certain earthquakes. A lot of specifications in a police building. And would it, uh, again, five years away, kind of a shock to hear that, but would it be at the same location there on Lincoln or is there, would there be a proposed different location? Right now the, the proposed location for a new public safety building would be um, in the 300 block of East Dallas South Street at the old Monterey County Corporation yard. And that's because the city is looking to redevelop that whole area that runs north and south al along the west side of Highway 101. And, and if, you, if you're familiar with that area, it's kind of tired. It's run down. There's a, you know, there's a, a the, the Sun Street transfer station. It's all a waste facility right in the center of the city. Um, so there's a lot of uh, interest in getting that moved out. And the idea is that a nice police facility that has public facilities in it, meeting spaces and things like that, would start to attract redevelopment down to that marketplace area. What about that fence around the police department? Uh, we covered that maybe a few months ago. Um, is that going to happen? I know it still costs a lot of money to do that much. It does cost a lot of money to do that much. And, and what you're referring to, Mark, for people that may not be aware of it, is 
anybody who's driven downtown Salinas is Your driven by the- Your back parking lot is it, completely open. It's completely open. It turns into a place for people to do U-turns and drop off their mail and walk through. And, and uh, you know, the police department attracts, unfortunately, a certain kind of people. And they're not always the happiest people in the world. And a lot of times they're criminals. A lot of times they're angry with us or anybody else. Um, they're, they've got uh, mental health issues. And in the back lot of the police department where civilian employees are coming out, our officers are getting ready to go to work. We've had a lot of dangerous situations generated back there. The industry standard is you have to protect your assets. Protect so why your police hasn't that happened? Because it's been a cost issue. This idea of offense has been going on since I became a Salinas police officer in 1988 and we just got the funding for it. Wow, yeah. so funding's in place. It is. Okay, so what's the timeline? Well, the, so, so we're, doing, we're doing the engineering on it. Um, it's being designed and uh, we should be, we should be um, starting to build here soon. We recently uh, ran a story. There was a, uh, what now became a homicide, a young boy, a teenager, uh, stabbed to death uh, in Salinas about a week or, or so ago. Turns out the uh, suspects in this case uh, were two females, uh, I believe two female juveniles. Uh, don't believe they've been arrested. That's right. Uh, but the issue of having women in gangs, what's the culture? So that case that you're describing is highly unusual. To see a woman perpetrate a homicide I know like we don't that, report on it much. Yeah, it's very unusual. But we've long known that women play a really important role in, in um, the gang lifestyle and in violence in Salinas. More often a supporting role in terms of carrying guns, communications, carrying messages, things like that. Actually committing acts of violence is incredibly rare. Generational though, right? I know we often talk about the families uh, going from one generation to the next with gang violence. How do you break it? And, and there you're Easier right. Easier said than done, right? Well, there you're right at the heart of the matter there. That's that, that really one of the things that, that people need to understand is when I talk about more police officers, I don't want more police officers to arrest people because making an arrest means that somebody has been victimized, a crime has already been committed. I'd rather have more police officers out there preventing crime, more police officers out there working towards an environment where people don't think they need to join a gang ever and those crimes aren't ever committed. So the answer is, do you want to the question is, would you rather see more arrests or would you rather see a reduction in crime? I think people, if you think that through, want to see a reduction in crime. Fewer people going to jail, putting someone in prison, I think the, the bill for that runs something like $45,000 a year per person. We're locking up 100,000 people a year. That's absurd. So why not keep people out of jail? Why not have a peaceful community where crime doesn't occur? And that's really the goal. Yeah, we say peaceful community, uh, past mayor, uh Dennis Donahue, uh, imagine a city, you know, for uh, the brand for the city of Salinas. Uh, this question coming from Cesar Rosales. Uh, we had one earlier. He sent in an, an additional question. So Cesar, thanks for sending this in. He says, in his opinion, gang problems in society arise out of adverse economic conditions. Uh, we see that in Salinas in certain areas. He goes on to talk about the tax. We've talked about the tax. Um, but do you agree with that, with, with what uh, Caesar's saying? 100%. Caesar's exactly right. Uh, adverse economic conditions, um, illiteracy is a huge predictor of gang activity. Disassociation at school, uh, kids having problems at school and being marginalized, being labeled at school, right? Special needs kids where they start to get made fun of and then they start looking for other people who will be more accepting of them. Who is that? Well, that's the gang. Um, people with um, uh, a broken home life where you've got parents who are um, incarcerated on drugs, whatever the case may be, and they're looking for the things that all humans look for, which is acceptance, love, protection, need for belonging. They'll go find that somewhere else. And if that isn't fulfilled by a family, isn't fulfilled by an athletic team um, or school, the gangs are right there to fill that role, and, and he's exactly right. That's how the gang problem is perpetuated. And giving a shout out right now, in case anyone from uh, Alice L High School is uh, watching here online, uh, you mentioned athletics. You know, you have their soccer team uh, that's just doing- Best in the state? Best in the state. I mean, just doing incredible, even ranked on the national level. And just, uh, you know, you interview these kids and the coach, and you can see they're just uh, determined, you know, doing such a great job, and they got focus. And they say, hey, it's keeping us off the streets. Uh, we need more of that. How do we increase it? We need a lot more of it. And, and, and soccer is the great example. If you go out to the Constitution soccer fields any given weekend, there are people lined up to wait those field, or to work to play on those fields. There is not enough capacity. 
um, nor is there, nor are there enough baseball diamonds or basketball hoops or volleyball courts. Those are all of those things that we need. Now, how you get there is again that question of investment. There are um, a lot of good people working hard to build soccer fields through um, donations and fundraising, just like the, the new football stadium that's going up in, uh, at the sports complex is gonna be serving thousands of kids who would otherwise be doing something maybe that they ought not to be doing, but they'll be on, on the athletic field. So what I would argue is an investment in safety, bringing calm to Salinas, creates better business opportunity more, business, more businesses come to Salinas, increases revenue generally, and that's where you start seeing the infrastructure development, more opportunities for youth, a calmer, um, uh, more um, uh, safe community where people are free to go out and play. Yeah, full circle, it yep. takes time. Uh, the city council, you know, when they talk about this, bringing in uh, businesses, and they've done a lot of it uh, over the past few years, bringing in new restaurants, uh, and that's what Caesar was talking about economically. How difficult is it? Is that why the city council spends so much time focusing um, on that need? I know Kimberly Craig, for example, one of the councilwomen, uh, is pretty passionate about bringing in the new business. There, I think if you asked our city manager, Ray Corp, is what, what his singular focus, his biggest focus is, is on that economic development piece. And it can, it, all this can go down to gangs. I mean, you, you, you get better business, better economy. I mean, that's what Caesar's asking. Well, I think, and I would point to San Jose as a great example of, 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 uh, of San Jose before, before the big technology boom had some pretty significant gang issues in East San Jose, King and Story Road. What really got San Jose out of it was this big economic turnaround where people, wealth started to increase generally, people were better employed, people who were uh, uh, or better educated started living in San Jose, better opportunity for the residents of San Jose, and as that opportunity increases, hope increases, the need to participate in gang activity decreases. So really, fundamentally, it's an economic, it's an economic path out of violence. We're not gonna arrest our way out of the problem. We've heard this for years and years. It's a question of preventing it from happening at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the entry point. And that entry point is illiteracy, hopelessness, poverty, the things that Caesar's talking about. All right, we have uh, just under 10 minutes left here on KIONRightNow.com. We thank all of you for logging on and watching this uh, live digital town hall meeting with Salinas Police Chief Kelly McMillan. Uh, here's a different question. This one was emailed in um, just earlier during this hour from Chris. Uh, Chris wants to know, do you think that your views on the issue of allowing law-abiding citizens the opportunity to protect themselves will change in the near future? Uh, police, although paid to do it, are not the only ones capable of training, thinking quickly, and dealing with stress of life and death. What, what do you think? So I assume that's the question of should, should non-police officers be, be carrying guns, um, the, the right to defend yourself. I will never, ever tell anyone they don't have the right to defend themselves. That's a separate question than do I think people should carry firearms for their own personal protection. I personally don't think that's a good idea. Um, a lot of people have their guns taken away from them and used against them. A lot of people, while like the idea of carrying a firearm, aren't well trained enough to do it. Um, I don't know Chris, I don't know what his skills are, and maybe he'd be perfectly equipped to handle a firearm. In my opinion, most people are not. And there's, uh, there's the debate, and we've been covering it, you know, uh, with all the discussions and the bills going through Congress um, about, you know, carrying guns, and some of the critics saying, hey, you know, this is my right, but aren't the lawmakers, they're talking about taking away, you know, those military assault weapons, the guns that people don't need. I mean, there's a difference when it comes to weapons. Uh, you agree? There are. There, absolutely. I, I, my personal view is, and my view is, you know, one of many out there, is that there, there's no need for people to have assault weapons. But the reality, and, and there's all this hysteria around assault weapons being banned and being taken away. Criminally speaking, assault weapons are just a, a tiny fraction of the crime. They're almost not a problem in Salinas. I can't remember the last time we had a shooting involving an assault weapon. The, uh, the weapon that is a problem in Salinas is a, a, a pistol, perfectly legal pistol, as long as you're uh, not a convicted felon or mentally ill or precluded otherwise from carrying it. That's the biggest problem in Salinas, and nobody's talking about banning those because it will never happen in our society. Let's be realistic about this. That's a Second Amendment right. The courts are clear on this. We're not going to take away handguns from people. But the idea of high-capacity, rapid-fire assault weapons that are designed for military purposes really, in my opinion, don't have a, a role in the civilian market. 
All right, we are in the final five minutes here on KIONRightNow.com with our digital uh, town hall meeting with Salinas Police Chief Kelly McMillan. Uh, again, so you've been here since 88 with the Salinas Police Department, um, brought on as chief just recently. What's your tenure? What are you thinking? How much longer do you have? Well, um, I, I'm, I plan on, I, when, when the city manager hired me, I told him I'd, I'd be here for five years, and that's, that's my plan. If, if, if it makes sense for me to stay longer than that, um, I will. But I, I think there's something to be said for fresh leadership. Uh, it's a difficult job. Um, I've been doing it for almost 30 years. Um, it takes its toll. And so I'm at some point looking forward to retirement, but that's not even on my, on my radar right now. I'm enjoying being chief. I'm enjoying the challenges of Salinas. I think the future is bright for Salinas, and that's where my focus is. You know, uh, Salinas Police Chief, uh, former uh, Chief Lewis Featheroff, Leaving perhaps earlier than a lot of people expected, uh, citing medical reasons, correct? Uh, you know, did that come as a shock and kind of shake up the department a bit? Well, it did. It, when, when Chief Featheroff was sworn in, I remember it clearly. He said that he had a 10-year plan. To it ended chief. up being about two years. It ended up being about two years. But the fact of the matter is, is his career prior to Salinas spanned more than 40 years. And so uh, health issues got the better of him and, and he really didn't have a choice. He didn't, he could no longer fulfill the roles of a police officer. Even the chief of police is expected to be able to go out and if need be, you know, chase down a criminal, make an arrest, jump over a fence, do all those things. And, and, and because of some injuries he sustained, he wasn't able to do that. So unfortunately we lost him. You, you still get out there to, to do that kind of thing? <laughs> I know uh, they say, you know, police chief is a desk job at times. The police chief is a just desk job at times, but, you know, do, do I occasionally make a traffic stop when I see a violation? Yeah, there's, I, still have, I still have the street cop in me to a certain extent. You know, I, I still want to go out and, you know, uh, arrested a couple of burglars a, a while ago just because I happen to be in the right place at the right time. So, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't happen as often as I'd like it to. There's a lot more paperwork than actual police work. So you prefer to be out there on the streets well, if I think you any, could. I think, I think any, any, any street cop does. You don't, you, don't, you don't sign up to become a cop in order to become the chief of police. That's a, that's a, that's a late career decision. Um, and you make certain sacrifices to do it. All right, I missed this question earlier. I want to get to it. This one via Twitter from Visa on Air, um, wanting to know why when activities happening in their neighborhood, uh, they don't find about they don't find out about it, uh, you know, from a police blotter. Uh, they find out about it turning on the news. Uh, they turn on the newscast. That's where they get their answer. Uh, but you have press releases that anyone can get. You have a Facebook page. You have a Twitter handle. Uh, is that where people can go to get more accurate, quick information? They can. But again, Mark, you, when when you're talking about a, a rapidly unfolding situation in somebody's neighborhood, a crime that's just occurred, uh, those police officers are busy investigating the crime. Um, we, I, I don't necessarily think people would want the police officers to interrupt a homicide investigation to send out a tweet. Sure. Now, we are getting better, I think, about our social media presence and our ability to communicate more directly to the public. Um, I mean, that'd be a whole separate full-time job for someone. It, it is. And, and, and what we've got, we've got a, a group of officers who are interested in this who are working on our Facebook page and working on Twitter and trying to be more proactive to do exactly that. In fact, we have a, a private Twitter feed with our schools. So when we have to lock down a school, we use Twitter and open source media like that in a closed loop to communicate with them. So we are we are doing it and I'd like to get better about it, but that's gonna be um, secondary to our primary function of law enforcement. Okay, wrapping up here, and here's a fun question sent in uh, via Facebook. Uh, this one asking uh, from Ronette Foster Dean. So Ronette, hope you're watching. Chief, did you originally own a Lincoln diesel years ago? If so, I love that card. People didn't believe that Lincoln ever made a diesel. I, 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 True I story? I wish I did own okay. it because, because it sounds like an interesting car, but I never did. So uh, that's the wrong person. Carlos Novoa, uh, so far, what do you think about the 49ers? Are we going to get back to another Super Bowl? I'm glad the 49ers are moving a little closer to Salinas, honestly. I don't know if I'll ever be able to afford a ticket. But Pretty amazing stadium they have being that built That is going to be phenomenal. Yeah, and, I'm, and, I, and I think we're going to feel the effects of that, especially when the Super Bowl shows up next year. Well, last year when we had uh, the San Francisco Giants in the World Series, it did become a crime concern. Uh, with a kind of a makeshift parade up Maine. Uh, so is that kind of a concern as well that, yeah, you got the fan support, but also maybe some of the partying that goes too far? You know, I think we always have to keep an eye on that because that's our job. Generally speaking, people are really well behaved around celebrating like that. We don't see, you know, the kind of, um, you know, the soccer hooliganism that some other countries have to deal with. We've never seen that in Salinas, but uh, 
I, I, I'd rather see the 49ers win and have a parade to deal with and have the 49ers lose and have nothing going on in town. All right, Salinas Police Chief Kelly McMillan, this was our very first digital town hall meeting at Central Coast News. We appreciate everyone who sent in all of these questions via email, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, we had many of them. Uh, the wife, the kids watching, anything you want to say to them? Yep, hello at home. Liam, enjoy your first day off from, uh, from school. And uh, we do hope to do another one of these in the near future. Of course, we are going to keep you posted on Central Coast News via our Facebook page uh, when we set one up. Uh, Chief, thanks for coming in. A pleasure. Mark, my pleasure. Thanks.